This is Chapter Two of the Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mutiny of the Bounty by William Bly. Chapter Two, Mutiny in the Ship, read by John Greenman. About three weeks were spent among the small islands which lie scattered round Otaheite, at some of which we touched. According to my instructions, my course was now through Endeavour Strait to Prince's Island, in the Strait of Sunda, between Sumatra and Java. On the 27th of April, at noon, we were between the islands of Tofoa and Kotu. Thus far the voyage had advanced in a course of uninterrupted prosperity, and had been attended with many circumstances equally pleasing and satisfactory. A very different scene was now to be experienced. Monday, 27th April, 1789. The wind being northerly in the evening, we steered to the westward, to pass to the south of Tofoa. I gave directions for this course to be continued during the night. The master had the first watch, the gunner the middle watch, and Mr. Christian the morning watch. Tuesday, 28th. Just before sunrising, while I was yet asleep, Mr. Christian, with the master-at-arms, gunner's mate, and Thomas Burkett, seaman, came into my cabin, and, seizing me, tied my hands with a cord behind my back, threatening me with instant death if I spoke or made the least noise. I, however, called as loud as I could, in hopes of assistance, but they had already secured the officers who were not of their party by placing sentinels at their doors. There were three men at my cabin door, besides the four within. Christian had only a cutlass in his hand, the others had muskets and bayonets. I was pulled out of bed, and forced on deck in my shirt, suffering great pain from the tightness with which they had tied my hands. I demanded the reason of such violence, but received no other answer than abuse for not holding my tongue. The master, the gunner, the surgeon, Mr. Elphinstone, master's mate, and Nelson were kept confined below, and the fore hatchway was guarded by sentinels. The boatswain and carpenter, and also the clerk, Mr. Samuel, were allowed to come upon deck. The boatswain was ordered to hoist the launch out, with a threat, if he did not do it instantly, to take care of himself. When the boat was out, Mr. Hayward and Mr. Hallett, two of the midshipmen, and Mr. Samuel were ordered into it. I demanded what their intention was in giving this order, and endeavored to persuade the people near me not to persist in such acts of violence, but it was to no effect. Christian changed the cutlass which he had in his hand for a bayonet that was brought to him, and, holding me with a strong grip by the cord that tied my hands, he with many oaths threatened to kill me immediately if I would not be quiet. The villains round me had their pieces cocked and bayonets fixed. Particular people were called on to go into the boat, and were hurried over the side, whence I concluded that with these people I was to be set adrift. I therefore made another effort to bring about a change, but with no other effect than to be threatened with having my brains blown out. The boatswain and seamen who were to go in the boat were allowed to collect twine, canvas, lines, sails, cordage, an eight-and-twenty-gallon cask of water, and Mr. Samuel got a hundred and fifty pounds of bread, with a small quantity of rum and wine, also a quadrant and compass but he was forbidden, on pain of death, to touch either map, ephemeris, book of astronomical observations, sextant, timekeeper, or any of my surveys or drawings. The officers were next called upon deck, and forced over the side into the boat, while I was kept apart from every one abaft the mizzenmast. Isaac Martin, one of the guard over me, I saw, had an inclination to assist me, and, as he fed me with shaddock, my lips being quite parched, we explained our wishes to each other by our looks, but this being observed, Martin was removed from me. He then attempted to leave the ship, for which purpose he got into the boat, but with many threats they obliged him to return. The armorer, Joseph Coleman, and two of the carpenters, Mackintosh and Norman, were also kept contrary to their inclination, and they begged of me, after I was astern in the boat, to remember that they declared they had no hand in the transaction. Michael Byrne, I am told, likewise wanted to leave the ship. 
it appeared to me that Christian was some time in doubt whether he should keep the carpenter or his mates. At length he determined on the latter, and the carpenter was ordered into the boat. He was permitted, but not without some opposition, to take his tool-chest. The officers and men being in the boat, they only waited for me, of which the master-at-arms informed Christian, who then said, "'Come, Captain Bly, your officers and men are now in the boat, and you must go with them. If you attempt to make the least resistance, you will be instantly put to death.' And without further ceremony, with a tribe of armed ruffians about me, I was forced over the side, where they untied my hands. Being in the boat, we were veered astern by a rope. A few pieces of pork were thrown to us, and some clothes, also four cutlasses. And it was then that the armorer and carpenters called out to me to remember that they had no hand in the transaction. After having undergone a great deal of ridicule, and been kept some time to make sport for these unfeeling wretches, we were at length cast adrift in the open ocean. I had eighteen persons with me in the boat. There remained on board the bounty twenty-five hands, the most able men of the ship's company. Having little or no wind, we rowed pretty fast towards Tofoa, which bore northeast about ten leagues from us. While the ship was in sight, she steered to the west-northwest, but I considered this only as a feint, for when we were sent away, Huzzah for Otaheite was frequently heard among the mutineers. It will very naturally be asked, what could be the reason for such a revolt? In answer to which I can only conjecture that the mutineers had flattered themselves with the hopes of a more happy life among the Otahetians than they could possibly enjoy in England. The chiefs were so much attached to our people that they rather encouraged their stay among them than otherwise, and even made them promises of large possessions. Under these and many other attendant circumstances equally desirable, it is now perhaps not so much to be wondered at, though scarcely possible to have been foreseen, that a set of sailors, most of them void of connections, should be led away, especially when, in addition to such powerful inducements, they imagined it in their power to fix themselves in the midst of plenty, on one of the finest islands in the world, where they need not labor. My first determination was to seek a supply of breadfruit and water at Tofoa, and afterwards to sail for Tonga Tabu, and there risk a solicitation to Poulaho, the king, to equip our boat, and grant us a supply of water and provisions, so as to enable us to reach the East Indies. The quantity of provisions I found in the boat was a hundred and fifty pounds of bread, sixteen pieces of pork, each piece weighing two pounds, six quarts of rum, six bottles of wine, with twenty-eight gallons of water, and four empty barracos. We got to Tofoa when it was dark, but we found the shore so steep and rocky that we could not land. We were obliged, therefore, to remain all night in the boat, keeping it on the lee side of the island with two oars. Next day, Wednesday, April 29, we found a cove where we landed. This is the northwest part of Tofoa, the northwesternmost of the friendly islands. As I was resolved to spare the small stock of provisions we had in the boat, we endeavored to procure something towards our support on the island itself. For two days we ranged through the island in parties, seeking for water and anything in the shape of provisions, subsisting, meanwhile, on morsels of what we had brought with us. The island at first seemed uninhabited, but on Friday, May 1st, one of our exploring parties met with two men, a woman, and a child. The men came with them to the cove, and brought two coconut shells of water. I endeavored to make friends of these people, and sent them away for breadfruit, plantains, and water. Soon after, other natives came to us, and by noon there were thirty about us, from whom we obtained a small supply. I was much puzzled in what manner to account to the natives for the loss of my ship. I knew they had too much sense to be amused with a story that the ship was to join me, when she was not in sight from the hills. I was at first doubtful whether I should tell the real fact, or say that the ship had overset and sunk, and that we only were saved. The latter appeared to be the most proper and advantageous for us, and I accordingly instructed my people that we might all agree in one story. 
as i expected inquiries were made about the ship and they seemed readily satisfied with our account but there did not appear the least symptom of joy or sorrow in their faces although i fancied i discovered some marks of surprise some of the natives were coming and going the whole afternoon towards evening i had the satisfaction to find our stock of provisions somewhat increased but the natives did not appear to have much to spare what they brought was in such small quantities that i had no reason to hope we should be able to procure from them sufficient to stock us for our voyage at night i served a quarter of a breadfruit and a coconut to each person for supper and a good fire being made all but the watch went to sleep saturday the second as there was no certainty of our being supplied with water by the natives i sent a party among the gullies in the mountains with empty shells to see what could be found in their absence the natives came about us as i expected and in greater numbers two canoes also came in from round the north side of the island in one of them was an elderly chief called maka akavo soon after some of our foraging party returned and with them came a good-looking chief called egijifo or ifo their affability was of short duration for the natives began to increase in number and i observed some symptoms of a design against us soon after they attempted to haul the boat on shore on which i brandished my cutlass in a threatening manner and spoke to ifo to desire them to desist which they did and everything became quiet again my people who had been in the mountains now returned with about three gallons of water i kept buying up the little breadfruit that was brought to us and likewise some spears to arm my men with having only four cutlasses two of which were in the boat as we had no means of improving our situation i told our people i would wait till sunset by which time perhaps something might happen in our favor for if we attempted to go at present we must fight our way through which we could do more advantageously at night and that in the meantime we would endeavor to get off to the boat what we had bought the beach was lined with the natives and we heard nothing but the knocking of stones together which they had in each hand i knew very well this was the sign of an attack at noon i served a coconut and a breadfruit to each person for dinner and gave some to the chiefs with whom i continued to appear intimate and friendly they frequently importuned me to sit down but i as constantly refused for it occurred both to nelson and myself that they intended to seize hold of me if i gave them such an opportunity keeping therefore constantly on our guard we were suffered to eat our uncomfortable meal in some quietness after dinner we began by little and little to get our things into the boat which was a troublesome business on account of the surf i carefully watched the motions of the natives who continued to increase in number and found that instead of their intention being to leave us fires were made and places fixed on for their stay during the night consultations were also held among them and everything assured me we should be attacked i sent orders to the master that when he saw us coming down he should keep the boat close to the shore that we might the more readily embark the sun was near setting when i gave the word on which every person who was on shore with me boldly took up his proportion of things and carried them to the boat the chiefs asked me if i would not stay with them all night i said no i never sleep out of my boat but in the morning we will again trade with you and i shall remain till the weather is moderate that we may go as we have agreed to see poulaho at tonga tabu maka akavao then got up and said you will not sleep on shore then mati which directly signifies we will kill you and he left me the onset was now preparing every one as i have described before kept knocking stones together and ifo quitted me all but two or three things were in the boat when we walked down the beach every one in a silent kind of horror we all got into the boat except one man who while i was getting on board quitted it and ran up the beach to cast the sternfast off notwithstanding the master and others calling to him to return while they were hauling me out of the water i was no sooner in the boat than the attack began by about two hundred men the unfortunate poor man who had run up the beach was knocked down 
and the stones flew like a shower of shot. Many Indians got hold of the stern rope, and were near hauling the boat on shore, which they would certainly have effected, if I had not had a knife in my pocket, with which I cut the rope. We then hauled off to the grapnel, every one being more or less hurt. At this time I saw five of the natives about the poor man they had killed, and two of them were beating him about the head with stones in their hands. We had no time to reflect, for, to my surprise, they filled their canoes with stones, and twelve men came off after us to renew the attack, which they did so effectually as nearly to disable us all. We were obliged to sustain the attack without being able to return it, except with such stones as lodged in the boat. I adopted the expedient of throwing overboard some clothes, which, as I expected, they stopped to pick up. And as it was by this time almost dark, they gave over the attack, and returned towards the shore, leaving us to reflect on our unhappy situation. The poor man killed by the natives was John Norton. This was his second voyage with me as a quartermaster, and his worthy character made me lament his loss very much. We set our sails, and steered along shore by the west side of the island of Tofoa, the wind blowing fresh from the eastward. My mind was employed in considering what was best to be done, when I was solicited by all hands to take them towards home, and when I told them that no hopes of relief for us remained, except what might be found at Australia, till I came to Timor, a distance of full twelve hundred leagues, where there was a Dutch settlement, but in what part of the island I knew not. They all agreed to live on one ounce of bread and a quarter of a pint of water per day. Therefore, after examining our stock of provisions and recommending to them in the most solemn manner not to depart from their promise, we bore away across a sea, where the navigation is but little known, in a small boat, twenty-three feet long, from stem to stern, deep-laden with eighteen men. I was happy, however, to see that every one seemed better satisfied with our situation than myself. Our stock of provisions consisted of about one hundred and fifty pounds of bread, twenty-eight gallons of water, twenty pounds of pork, three bottles of wine, and five quarts of rum. The difference between this and the quantity we had on leaving the ship was principally owing to our loss in the bustle and confusion of the attack. A few coconuts were in the boat, and some breadfruit, but the latter was trampled to pieces. Sunday the 3rd at daybreak the gale increased. The sun rose very fiery and red, a sure indication of a severe gale of wind. At eight it blew a violent storm, and the sea ran very high, so that between the seas the sail was becalmed, and when on top of the sea it was too much to have set. But we could not venture to take in the sail, for we were in very imminent danger and distress the sea curling over the stern of the boat, which obliged us to bail with all our might. A situation more distressing has perhaps seldom been experienced. Our bread was in bags, and in danger of being spoiled by the wet. To be starved to death was inevitable, if this could not be prevented. I therefore began to examine what clothes there were in the boat, and what other things could be spared, and having determined that only two suits should be kept for each person, the rest was thrown overboard, with some rope and spare sails, which lightened the boat considerably, and we had more room to bail the water out. Fortunately the carpenter had a good chest in the boat, in which we secured the bread the first favorable moment. His tool-chest also was cleared, and the tools stowed in the bottom of the boat, so that this became a second convenience. I served a teaspoon of rum to each person, for we were very wet and cold with a quarter of a breadfruit, which was scarce eatable for dinner. Our engagement was now strictly to be carried into execution, and I was fully determined to make our provisions last eight weeks, let the daily proportion be ever so small. Monday the 4th. At daylight our limbs were so benumbed that we could scarcely find the use of them. At this time I served a teaspoonful of rum to each person, from which we all found great benefit. Just before noon we discovered a small flat island of a moderate height, bearing west-southwest four or five leagues, having made a distance of ninety-five miles since yesterday noon. 
I divided five small coconuts for our dinner, and every one was satisfied. During the rest of that day we discovered ten or twelve other islands, none of which we approached. At night I served a few broken pieces of breadfruit for supper, and performed prayers. Tuesday the 5th. The night having been fair, we awoke after a tolerable rest, and contentedly breakfast on a few pieces of yams that were found in the boat. After breakfast we examined our bread, a great deal of which was damaged and rotten. This, nevertheless, we were glad to keep for use. We passed two islands in the course of the day. For dinner I served some of the damaged bread and a quarter of a pint of water. Wednesday the 6th. We still kept our course in the direction of the north of Australia, passing numerous islands of various sizes, at none of which I ventured to land. Our allowance for the day was a quarter of a pint of coconut milk and the meat, which did not exceed two ounces to each person. It was received very contentedly, but we suffered great drought. To our great joy we hooked a fish, but we were miserably disappointed by its being lost in trying to get it into the boat. As our lodgings were very miserable and confined for want of room, I endeavored to remedy the latter defect by putting ourselves at watch and watch, so that one half always sat up while the other lay down on the boat's bottom or upon a chest, with nothing to cover us but the heavens. Our limbs were dreadfully cramped, for we could not stretch them out, and the nights were so cold, and we so constantly wet, that after a few hours' sleep we could scarcely move. Thursday the 7th. Being very wet and cold, I served a spoonful of rum and a morsel of bread for breakfast. We still kept sailing among islands, from one of which two large canoes put out in chase of us, but we left them behind. Whether these canoes had any hostile intention against us must remain a doubt. Perhaps we might have benefited by an intercourse with them. But in our defenseless situation, to have made the experiment would have been risking too much. I imagine these to be the islands called Fiji, as their extent, direction, and distance from the friendly islands answer to the description given of them by those islanders. Heavy rain came on at four o'clock, when every person did his utmost to catch some water, and we increased our stock to thirty-four gallons, besides quenching our thirst for the first time since we had been at sea. But an attendant consequence made us pass the night very miserably, for being extremely wet, and having no dry things to shift or cover us, we experienced cold shiverings scarcely to be conceived. Most fortunately for us, the forenoon, Friday 8th, turned out fair, and we stripped and dried our clothes. The allowance I issued to-day was an ounce and a half of pork, a teaspoonful of rum, half a pint of coconut milk, and an ounce of bread. The rum, though small in quantity, was of the greatest service. A fishing line was generally towing from the stern of the boat, but though we saw a great number of fish, we could never catch one. In the afternoon we cleaned out the boat and it employed us till sunset to get everything dry and in order. Hitherto I had issued the allowance by guess, but I now made a pair of scales with two coconut shells, and having accidentally some pistol balls in the boat, twenty-five of which weighed one pound, or sixteen ounces, I adopted one, it weighed two hundred and seventy-two grains, as the proportion of weight that each person should receive of bread at the times I served it. I also amused all hands with describing the situation of New Guinea and Australia, and gave them every information in my power that, in case any accident happened to me, those who survived might have some idea of what they were about, and be able to find their way to Timor, which at present they knew nothing of more than the name, and some not even that. At night I served a quarter of a pint of water and a half an ounce of bread for supper. End of chapter 2